Uh, Arvind Chittamala created Moksha Festival because we felt that there was so much negativity around us in the world. Every day you read on the internet and we're exposed to so much negativity and uh, we wanted to promote conflict resolution and talk about what works for us and the people on this panel have studied and practiced uh, things that have really helped them move forward and practice. Uh, be healthy. So we wanted to pull together a panel of experts that can talk about what works for you and what some of your anecdotes are. Um, vipassana meditation uh, is also called insight meditation and it's actually a meditation that, that uh, Buddha taught. You know we go through life and the, the pace at which we go through life so many things happen to us and we very easily just kind of bury or shove our emotions or avoid them or, or um, you know, deny them. And this was a practice where, you know, I would, we'd sat for an hour, then we walked for an hour, engaging in this practice. And by the, um, it was terrifying in the beginning because, you know, there's no way to avoid who you are and what you feel about yourself in the world. Um, but it's only in being with it that you can get to the other side of it. And of course, underneath, you know, any anger, resentment, you know, fear, sadness, there's, there's just love, that's, 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 that's our essence. Meditating and getting in touch with myself, having a deeper relationship with myself, translates into my energy level being different, me being more comfortable um, with myself and more focused. To do what it is, is called to discover, uncover, and discard. And as a result of doing that one day at a time, uh, we become chosen and gifted. We want to get back into yoga and eating properly. We, our thoughts are not about ourselves anymore. We want to be of service. You've had a fascinating, long, winding road with great peaks. And how did you stay healthy with all, within all of that? Were you always healthy? And if not, what worked for you in getting healthy? I found myself at a, at a threshold uh, where I had all of this poison in my system and I got cancer twice, which is now in remission and I almost died, and I could almost swear I heard a voice saying, go back, it's not your turn. So it's, since it has been my choice, or somebody else's choice, to keep me on the planet, if I don't do this every day, this service, and speak like this to whoever might be listening, I won't be here. Dr. Saramzin Khalsa, uh, first let's talk about Yogi Bhajan, and then we'll get into more of your personal work. Uh, what would you like to share about Yogi Bhajan? I'll leave the question very open so you can start where you want. Well, I'm very honored to be here today. <clears throat> and I too am a certified Kundalini Yoga teacher, so we have three out of four <laughs> Kundalini Yoga. I feel very blessed in that, you know how they always say there's a silver lining in every cloud and, and that expression of life is what happens to you when you have other plans. I'm a perfect example of that. I had wanted to be a physician since I was a little boy. And after four years at Yale College, I was pretty exhausted. But after the first year of medical school, I developed what now is called chronic fatigue syndrome. And I came to meet Yogi Bhajan, direct. And I was brought in to see him. This is in the early 70s. He asked me my name and what I did, and I said, I'm a doctor, but I've dropped out. I'm a pre I'm in medical school, but I've dropped out. And he said, why have you dropped out? I said, I'm tired all the time. He said, you must go back to school. You are going to be my physician. So he set me on an intensive track of six weeks of intensive yoga, meditation. I had already changed my diet and become a vegetarian. And after those six weeks, I was well, and I was able to go back to medical school finish medical school. Obviously, I saw the power of diet, the power of consciousness, the power of yoga to help people, and I right away began using natural medicines. So in my practice, I used herbs and vitamins and acupuncture. I studied acupuncture and started doing it. And that's how I got connected to Hollywood, because Hollywood people are always on the cutting edge, as we know. They're always looking for the new thing. And what I did was the new thing. And this is in the late 70s. And so my practice became very busy very, very quickly and has remained so um, ever since. And are most of my patients from Hollywood? No, but are a lot of my patients from Hollywood? Yes. Well, first of all, I'm going to see this gentleman tomorrow sometime. 
Anyway, <laughs> I'm, I'm a first in line right here. But uh, it's, it's like a, it's like a, like all all mankind. It's it's a trial and error. Uh, you uh, go to the top doctors, the ones are in the magazines, and uh, they put you on these these medicines, and, uh, and then you gotta overcome the medicines. I woke up one morning smelling like a pharmacy, uh, and I had to take twenty things three times a day, otherwise it's over. Uh, I just started to look at the side effects. And one side effect is suicidal tendencies. Another is a depression. So now, how am I gonna know that I'm gonna be rid of what I got to the winter of the doctor's in the first place? Now I'm able as an internist to integrate the best of Western medicine with all these natural modalities to help people minimize their need for drugs and surgeries. But that doesn't mean I'm opposed to drugs and surgeries if that's the best answer. And so we're really integrating all the aspects of healing. And if it works and is effective and is helpful, I will use it to help people get well and stay well. Um, after being in an ashram, uh, re-entering a busy professional life, sometimes it's challenging to uh, maintain a consistency of practice. Uh, so, what can you tell us about that? What has worked? How often do you practice meditation? What are the benefits? And what comes up for you specifically during your meditations? I found something that, to this day, even though I don't go, um, sometimes I go every day, sometimes I go three times a week or whenever I'm available to go, but I found something that has helped to spiritually ground me. And as you, as you were saying with, with Hollywood, <laughs> A non-attachment you need something what actually whether or not you're an actor in Hollywood or just a human being walking around you I think you need something that spiritually grounds you whatever practice speaks to you and whatever practice works for you um, having that daily connection to source is vital and I agree whether you're an actor or just you know, whatever you're doing you know it's like I, I brush my teeth every day to clean whatever I put in my mouth I gotta do the same thing with my mind. So every morning and every night, just 11 minutes. It's very simple, but it has this cleansing effect. So I don't go to bed with the remnants of the day. And when I wake up, I can kind of cleanse whatever may have come up during my sleep. I'm pointing at joy because of her name. You gotta do things that bring you joy. That, I mean, that's kind of a meditation in, in and of itself as well. Can you share with us some of your personal cleansing techniques uh, psychically or spiritually that you do to prepare for a day dealing with people who are struggling with illness? It is just through my own sadhana, um, as you stated, that I am able to keep my centeredness. And uh, every morning for f over 40 years now, I've had the blessing to do a Kundalini Yoga sadhana and yoga and meditation. So, but my diet is very critical to my body and I have refined my own diet over the last couple of years, and I'm now on a whole food plant-based diet, period. I've been vegetarian, had been vegetarian for 40 years, but I've come to realize the problems with milk, and so now I'm a whole food plant-based nutritionist, uh, a nutrition doctor. What, what was the second question, Julie? Well, I'd like you to give us two, three-minute capsule of what to eat. 90% of our chronic disease is completely reversible with lifestyle. There is a magic medicine which can cure high blood pressure, cure diabetes, cure cancer, cure heart disease, prevent heart attacks. It's called food. <laughs> food directly talks to our genes. Our genes are not written in stone. So many of my patients come in saying, I got the gene for this. My father had heart disease. My, father, my mother had breast cancer. Our gene, genes are not written in stone. There are many U's within the expression of your genes. And this is a science of medicine called epigenetics. Epi means above the gene. And food is one of the most powerful epigenetic molecules. With food, Properly, properly chosen, we can all stay proactively healthy. So I truly recommend organic food to everybody. The problems that we're having with pesticides, 
with, with the uh, endocrine disruptors that are in food, such as, as phthalates that are in our personal care products, are directly linked to so many of the diseases in our society. And this obesity epidemic, which is now worldwide now, it's not just in the, it's the developed countries, it's in third world countries, is completely taking over with diabetes and heart disease and high blood pressure. We are, we are at the point by the end of this decade where one in two Americans, will either, one out of two Americans will either be diabetic or pre-diabetic. And we don't have enough money to pay for the drugs for this. It's a huge epidemic. My friend Mark Hyman calls it the diabetes <laughs> epidemic. Victor, as I said, for 40 years since I became a Sikh, since I studied, began studying with Yogi Bhajan, I was vegetarian. Um, and, but that includes milk and dairy products, yogurt, etc. And I took a course from Cornell University last year in whole food plant-based nutrition, taught by Colin Campbell and, and Caldwell Esselstyn and, and Dean Ornish and so on. And I've come to realize the problems that we have with milk and the milk industry. That, indus that food preparation has become an industry uh, with cows with constantly uh, suction machines on their udders, they keep them pregnant, and it's like um, these cows become a machine, they get mastitis, so as one of my friends says, milk is nothing but pus, blood, and sweat. That's, what's, that's basically what milk is. We have a problem with the statin drugs because there's a, it's, people who are taking statin drugs, we're now recognizing, have a 40% higher rate of getting diabetes. In addition, Diabetes drugs cause heart attacks. So we've got an opposite causing each other. As again, one of my friends called this, it's Farmageddon is what's going on. As a clinical psychotherapist in my own practice working with patients, a lot of people's self-talk is exposed. Stuff that comes up during their dreams, during their meditation, they journal it and they bring it in and they say, well, these are the loops that are going around in my brain and I can't seem to interrupt them. And that definitely ties in with how we eat. There are these little phrases, oh, but it's comfort food, and oh, but I need this, and this will give me energy. So let's talk a little bit about that, about what is some of your self-talk and how you've managed to interrupt it and to redirect it. During my time at the, the, the Vipassana retreat, um, you know, there was so much unresolved emotion, emotional pain and trauma, and so a lot of the self-talk was coming from that place. And so, again, the practice allowed, it was structured so that I couldn't escape it. I had to be with it, and then with the healing of whatever emotions or trauma that was there, by being with it, there was like, the self-talk changes. And that's what I found. I guess I, I really value the practice of meditation because for me it's allowed me to understand that the identity is not who I am, it's a story that my mind's created that's largely based on those childhood emotional traumas. I mean, as far as self-talk goes, um, the distance or the non-attachment to that, to that identity can allow one to simply um, watch that self-talk as noise and not be really attached to it or believe in it. How do you, um, what do you recommend if you're on a plant-based diet, if an external stressor happens, like one's house burns down or a relative dies or God forbid something happens? What do you do with your diet to support you during those trying times? As I said, it's harder to change your diet than to change your religion. I get massive stressors. I've got sick patients, I've got phone calls, but it doesn't even approach me that food is the answer to that question if I'm feeling under stress. So that's not part of, food is not part of my stress management uh, approach to life, or it's not part of my stress management tools. I do wanna say that this whole understanding about protein um, and the whole idea of how much protein we need is really over the top. And uh, in my opinion, and I know this is being videotaped, I believe that the meat industry has uh, coordinated, shall we say, with governmental agencies 
to make these uh, protein requirements astronomical so that you almost have to eat meat to get that much protein. And the, the World Health Organization has told us, and that's what I listen to because they're not a political organization, recommends a half a milligram of protein per kilogram of body weight. So for example, a person that weighs, a man that weighs a, a, a 75 kilogram man is typically what we talk about, which is like 160 pound man, needs approximately 32 grams of protein a day. You can get that from broccoli. So if you're going for these 70 and 80 grams of protein a day, then you're almost going to be forced to get animal products, either direct or indirect. Um, Colin Campbell's work has clearly shown that a higher protein diet contributes to cancer, a lower protein diet it discourages cancer. Um, and the data on that is, is very, very solid. But I do encourage you to watch a couple movies in regards to food. Food Inc. is a great video, it's on Netflix. And also Forks Over Knives, which is also available on Netflix. I think the difference is, is the commercial the meats are not the same. The meats have additives and chemicals in them. And the eggs have, have, have hormones in them. We have nine-year-old girls who are menstruating today. The meat is a foregone conclusion. If I eat meat very rarely, it's got to come from a specific farm where I know how that child, that cow or that, that, that food was, was, was raised. Very rarely do I eat pork, but it's got to come from some place where it's raised like the old ways, including fish now that comes from fish farms and they put chemicals in them. So now we have some due diligence today. We didn't have that before. I wanna, if you could just tell who Yogi Banja is and what really is Kundalini Yoga and where it came from and what was that transition? Uh, for those who don't know, could you please tell us who was Yogi Bhajan and uh, so many people in America, and we've noticed in Hollywood too, Kundalini has really exploded in popularity. Um, it's helped many people with Western mindset transition and start integrating and including some of the wisdom of the East. And so can you give us a little historical context about Yogi Bhajan, please? Well, I guess I'm the perfect person to answer that question since I was very blessed to meet him when he first came, shortly after he first came to America. Yogi Bhajan was a man who was born in India. Um, he was uh, given yogic and spiritual training as a young boy, uh, especially by his grandfather, and, but then had a normal job in India. He was working with the customs department, and then he had a spiritual master and a spiritual teacher who guided him, and then one day his spiritual master, and I'm not sure how old he was, I think he was like 16, or something he said, you know everything that I can teach now, it is you are becoming the teacher. And so he began to teach yoga in his free time um, and while he was working at his job. And then one day, um, he felt that our, um, one of our, the Sikh gurus, Guru Ram Das, advised him that he was to leave India and bring the teaching of Kundalini Yoga to the West. And so he moved to Canada and then he moved to America and he began teaching Kundalini Yoga, subsequently introduced all of us to White Tantric Yoga as well. And Kundalini Yoga is a form of yoga, it's one of the major forms of yoga that we have in Los Angeles, uh, that works with helping move the Kundalini energy up our spine into our higher centers so that we can stay in a higher state of consciousness uh, all the time. From a psychologist's point of view, if a human animal is in a toxic environment, how can we uh, uh, somehow have, uh, have power over how much that toxicity affects us? In the psychotherapy work that I do, I do see that there is an inextricable link between what's going on in the mind and what's going on in the body, and I really don't see that they are separate entities that we need to create some false sense of oneness. I think we need to reintegrate the fact that they are one, that when, um, when you take your pulse and we notice how many heartbeats per inhale and how many heartbeats per exhale, you're taking your vital signs in a very primitive way, and, and within that you can see how you're managing 
internally the stimulation of stress from the outside world. So if the outside world is a war and bombs and horror happening, you do have a choice of how you're going to receive that. There's a space. You don't have to immediately go into an acute stress response. And I think part of the mastery that we're all talking about is having a choice so that we can say, there's bad things happening in the outside world and I have a choice if I want to let that infiltrate into my being or, or if I can take a breath and observe it and, and acknowledge it but not be reactive. I switched from regular milk to organic. Is that good? <laughs> I'm sorry this is getting so fixated on milk. <laughs> Uh, organic milk is much, much better because it doesn't have the pesticides. And, but I, I don't know exactly how, how organic cows are milked. But please understand the milk industry is an industry. It's a corporation. They put these suction devices on the, the, the cow's udders and the cow is just continuously sucked day and night standing in their own poop and urinating there and everything in one place. So this milk gets lots of stuff, like I said earlier, in it. So if they let the cows, if you live on a farm and you have your own cows, like Lou was saying, and they're grazing in the grass, and not just eating what they were fed by the, meat, by the milk industry, which you know they're given hormones as well, estrogen to stay pregnant and so on, but if you have your own cow and you milk this cow, that's gonna be a much, much, much healthier milk than what you get at the health food store or the grocery store. Is there some alternative to using milk as comfort food and finding nutrients in other sources? One thing on milk I forgot to say. Reminder that humans are the only species in the world that drink cross-species milk. I'm a professional in the field of aging, and I love hearing these stories about 100-year-old people and also come from a long-lived family. But now I have a situation where my mother is showing signs of dementia, and we don't know. It could be you know, vascular, it could be diet, which is an issue for her, and so on and so forth. But whenever I talk about things like meditation, and she's a very devout Catholic, she's, well, I pray. So I'm trying to think of ways to you know, talk to not only my mother, but older people, at least the current generation, many of them think about a lot of these things, yoga and meditation, you know, that they're sort of identified with certain religions. But in fact, many of these practices, like, like you know, prayer, is a, it could be considered a form of meditation. I'm wondering how some of you, because you represent a lot of different cultures here too, how you might approach this with older people who might be having symptoms that are dementia related and some of these practices that are not focused so much on medication. My mother, who I really adore, she's raised Catholic and she has a very strong prayer practice. Now, the mantras that we chant um, are sacred chants and they come from a sacred text and they are, um, they are reflecting our God consciousness. And um, I think prayers in different religions can do the same. Um, my concern is that, you know, sometimes in certain prayers I see, um, you know, I guess what I would call a victim consciousness, and that's, that's my judgment, I know. Um, and, and, and so that's where my personal concern comes in as a son to a mother I, I adore. Um, but where I kind of bring it with my mom is I take her to lunch every Wednesday, and I just say, Mom, because she's very chatty, I say, Mom, can we just breathe together? and we'll just be present, and that's kind of our practice. My aunt's Catholic, I was baptized Catholic, but I don't consider myself Catholic. Um, and she was really sort of like taken back that I had, um, you know those candles that have like the Spanish saints on them and stuff, so mm -hmm. I had those, but then I had Buddhas, and then I had like a stark uh, David over here. She was like, whoa, 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 what are you, what, what are you doing? And she thought it was like blast. She thought I was like seriously going to hell or something. And I was like, well, I mean, I feel that I don't think that it's, you know, a contradiction or anything like that. I think that all religions um, or spiritual practices, I think the essence of, of all of them are the same. I think it's love, compassion, understanding for the next person. And you, you can be a Catholic, you can um, go to Kundalini, you can 
be Jewish or whatever. I think that's the essence. So maybe it's sort of just finding that common ground that people can relate to. And also too, it's like what works for me, the same thing with food, like what works for me, everyone's got their thing, baby, and it's okay. You know, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for you. And I'm not gonna try and make you see my way. My short answer is that your grandmother's or mother's prayer is a meditation. And especially, um, don't try to make her you um, and help her to be who she is. And so if she uses a rosary, that's the same thing as one of us using a mala. And so her prayer is her meditation. And uh, I like Rahi's idea of just sitting and breathing and being with your mother, holding her hand and just uh, connecting. That's a form of meditation. It doesn't need to be the Eastern meditations that we've been talking about today. And also to remember that it's the attachment. I know you're a psychologist and that's the attachment. And if she's feeling that the dementia, dementia might be a reminder that she's closer to death, that um, to hold her hand and feel a connection and attachment and that might um, lessen her fear a little bit. Well, this has been, uh, it's rolled along and such fascinating people to talk with. And I'm really grateful that you all came and that you decided to say yes to the email and show up and be here and bring all of your history and wisdom with you. Thank you so much.